Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, yeah. So my name is Yogis, and I work as a cyber security analyst uh, analyst at TCS Cyber Security Unit India, where I spend a lot of time working on IoT and mobile application security. Uh, apart from that, I love to build and play with robots, and sometimes break them very often. Uh, and today I'm here to talk about uh, the security in Bluetooth low energy devices and uh, how to hack the fitness trackers. Uh, so let me tell you a story. It all began a year and a half uh, back when I started getting excited about IoT security. Uh, it's just that I saw many people having IoT devices at their home. Uh, IoT was just booming up. So as a security guy, I had to focus on IoT. And then I realized I needed a device. So I got myself a fitness tracker, definitely not to stay fit, but to hack it. So uh, once I got the fitness tracker, I started researching more and more about how does it connect to the mobile application and uh, what are the communication protocol that it uses uh, to interact with the mobile application. And then I realized there is a communication protocol called BLE, uh, uh, far more less or different than uh, your Bluetooth classic, but uh, pretty much almost same. So it uses BLE uh, protocol to communicate with your mobile application. And then I started realizing that I could do something really cool with that. So, and then I started hunting for, uh, you know, box in that fitness tracker and then I found something really cool. So, this talk will be on how I found the vulnerability in the um, fitness trackers and how I was able to hack into the fitness trackers. So, uh, expectation. So, what can you expect from this talk? Uh, you'll be getting a basic understanding of Bluetooth uh, and then I'll talk about what exactly is the difference between Bluetooth Classic and uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. And then after that, I'll be talking about the BLE stack and uh, what we generally call Bluetooth man the middle attack, which is capturing the BLE packet. So whatever conversation that you have between your mobile application and your uh, fitness tracker. So uh, I'll be talking about how to capture them and what hardware or what software you need them. Uh, and then after that, I have reverse engineering the mobile application of fitness trackers. Uh, it, it could be anything. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of time what happens is uh, in these smart so-called smart devices, uh, they have that um, on mobile application. Uh, and then these hard, um, hardware manufacturers forgotten to harden the security, uh, uh, harden, for, for, forgot to harden the reverse engineering process. So what happens is a lot of information could be gathered from here. So I'll tell you how, how exactly to reverse engineer the mobile applications. And at the end, I'll be talking about how to upload the firmware over the year. This is something really cool. So if you want to upload the firmware over the year uh, in the BLE devices, I'll be talking about how exactly to do them. So all right, first thing, uh, first let's talk about Bluetooth. Bluetooth is a short wireless, uh, short range wireless communication protocol and allows devices such as your uh, smartphones, headset, uh, and many other uh, smart bulbs it is easy to connect with each other and share the data and advice uh, wirelessly. It was developed in 1994 uh, by Ericsson uh, as a replacement for cables and uses 2.4 gigahertz frequency and creates a 10 meter radius called Piconet. Uh, and for many years what happened was it had con uh, con constant data transmission that just means high power consumption, right? When you have constant data transmission in the device, it has high power consumption. When it has high power consumption, this Bluetooth uh, application suffered a lame battery life for many years. Until a few years ago, uh, Bluetooth 4.0, or uh, what we can uh, generally call Bluetooth Smart came into the scene. It's basically the power efficient version of Bluetooth that has made many amazing devices possible, like your fitness trackers, your coffee makers, your light bulbs, uh, and many uh, medical devices, EDC. Uh, if you see the applications of BLE devices, it's right now everywhere. Uh, this version of Bluetooth Smart, or simply called BLE, is designed to be power efficient and low cost. And that's the reason why you can get these BLE devices for as low as 7 to 8 dollars. You can get any BLE applications for 7 to 8 dollars. But yes, BLE is an awesome technology. It allows, it enables us to connect to everyday things that we thought wouldn't be possible to do. Uh, have you ever thought that we would be any day connecting the smart shoes with your, uh, uh, fit, uh, sorry, with your mobile application? Not right. So right now, um, thanks to BLE, uh, smart shoes are out there in the wild and you could uh, uh, count how many steps that you walked and you could do so much things with your smart shoes, right? Uh, so now let's talk about uh, what exactly is the difference between the Bluetooth Classic and uh, BLE. So uh, this Bluetooth Classic is generally what you see in your fitness, uh, sorry, in your uh, 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 headset, in your Bluetooth speakers and BLE is what you generally see in the smart devices. So this Bluetooth Classic is great for product that requires the continuous streaming of data. Your headphone has to have the continuous streaming of data, right? Your uh, Bluetooth speaker has to have the con continuous streaming of data. So in those applications, Bluetooth Classic is uh, always preferred. Uh, so when it has higher, uh, sorry, it has continuous streaming of data, it has higher power consumption and needs to have a faster data rate as well. Uh, but on the other hand, I have this Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, this Bluetooth uh, Low Energy is great for product that not require the continuous streaming of data. Like maybe in your uh, uh, smart bulb, just to send on or off to the bulb, right? 
So in that case, you don't need the device to continuously send on, 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 right? You don't have to send that. So in that case, we prefer BLE over uh, Bluetooth Classic. Uh, and it has an ultra low power consumption. Uh, since, uh, since it doesn't have to do the continuous data transmission, it can go for slow data rate as well. The beauty of uh, BLE is that it is designed to operate in a sleep mode and waken up only when the connection is initiated. So what happens is you have a Bluetooth uh, low energy device, uh, maybe a smart bulb, the connection between your central server that is a mobile application and the uh, Bluetooth application, the connection is uh, on sleep mode when there is, no, there is nothing to send. So it is waken up only when the connection is initiated. That's the reason why you have fitness trackers that can go on and on and on for days and days. The battery life can go on and on for days and days, right? Uh, and this is best suited for your home automation, fitness trackers, and many other things. But being said that it is not perfect, it has flaws. Almost at any point in time, uh, it's discoverable. It's like, hey, I'm here, send me any information and I'm gonna spit out. Uh, send me anything and I'm gonna spit out the information. Uh, it works on the same frequency and same channel always. There is no channel hopping. So if, the, if you want to do, um, you know, uh, a denial of service attack, it can happen because there is no channel hopping here. Uh, and almost at any point in time, it allows any device to connect to it. Uh, and on top of that, most of the uh, devices do not take the benefit of link layer security, link layer encryption. So what happens is, if they implement this link layer encryption, the cost of the devices are going to go up high. But they have to sell a lot of them, right? So uh, these hardware manufacturers blindly do not, uh, you know, uh, have has this uh, link layer encryption. But there are few devices like your smart watches that are costly uh, that can go for two hundred uh, dollars and up. That that really has the uh, link layer encryption. You can capture the packets in between. Uh, you can perform the man the middle attack, but the packets are encrypted. Uh, yes, you can decrypt the packets also. So now let's go back to the fitness tracker that I talked earlier. I decided to focus on the fitness tracker. It's, uh, it's because I saw many people using that. Uh, and I decided it would be really fun to pop up some notification, pop up some uh, messages on my friend's fitness trackers. Uh, and to do that, uh, we need to understand <coughs> this BLE stack. So in BLE, this is the BLE stack. So in BLE stack, there are two really important that you need to uh, remember. That is generic attribute profile and generic uh, access profile. So the first thing, uh, GAT. GAT defines the way these BLE devices communicate with each other, the client and the server. The client could be your fitness tracker and the server could be a mobile application uh, using something called service and characteristics. Remember this term service and characteristics, I'm gonna use it very often. Uh, and I'll tell you what exactly is that. So here, uh, connections are exclusive in uh, BLE, the connections are exclusive. When I say exclusive, it's uh, suppose when the client, that means a BLE device, uh, is connected to one central server at a time, uh, it won't advertise itself, saying that, hey, I'm here. So once it is connected, it goes into the, uh, it stops advertising itself, so no any other device can be connected until the connection is actually broken. So now, uh, here in BLE, we have something called profile. Profile is actually, uh, it doesn't actually exist in a BLE, but it's just a collection of service and characteristics. Service defines, uh, it's a set of provided features associated with, uh, with the associated behavior to interact with the peripheral. Each service has own collection of characteristics. Characteristics are defined attribute uh, types that, are, that contains a single logical value. Now, example, in your fitness tracker, service could be something like device information. Device information is a service and characteristic could be something like uh, software revision number, hardware revision number, uh, or maybe any, any value. And maybe your hardware name or something like that, right? Uh, so now, uh, this is an app that is there in the Play Store. If you want to install, I'll talk about this app uh, on the later slides. This is an app called NRF Connect, which allows you to scan the nearby BLE devices. So if you see here, there is something called device information down there, which has a uh, UUID as well. So the device information is actually a service. Inside that, if you uh, you know, uh, if you open up that, you would see software revision number, uh, hardware re revision number, and the device name itself. So this uh, is uh, this is the actual definition of service and characteristics. So what happens is, if you really wanted to attack a BLE device, there are a few uh, basic process. The first is step number zero, selecting the target. So here, what happens is you would, uh, want to collect more and more information about the device. Uh, it's always better to actually refer the hardware manufacturer's manual. There is nothing as better than a hardware manufacturer's manual to grab more and more information about the devices, right? Uh, and in Linux, if you are in Linux, there are many other many tools like uh, Bluzy Stack, Atsay Tool, and Gat Tool, which allows you to, you know, gather more and more information about the devices and the step number zero once uh, uh, step number one once you have all the information about the device now you're good to go so now you want to animate the service and characteristics you want to figure out how many services are running in that particular one um, and how many characteristics are running there and you want to figure out what service does exactly what and what characteristic does exactly what uh, uh, so 
uh, yeah, uh, the basic process is you, you could use the uh, tools like HCA tool to scan the nearby devices uh, and then uh, connect using something called GAT tool. And then uh, you can list down all the service and characteristics. Sometimes, most of the times, what happens is your uh, characteristics uh, are just unknown services. If you want to figure out what exactly uh, characteristic is doing what, you could just do Google search. Uh, there you could find many information. And then step number two, that is reverse engineering the mobile application, if they have any. Uh, for reverse engineering, uh, in uh, Linux, we have something called APK tool. Using that, you could reverse engineer APK tool minus D. Uh, uh, they could decompile any Android applications. So what happens here is, uh, like I was working on a uh, hacking a smart lock that you uh, that you generally get. So I ordered it from somewhere from China, and once I got it, I reverse engineered the mobile application. Uh, the default password uh, to unlock that lock. Uh, so suppose if you don't have the mobile phone with you, or maybe you want to physically unlock that lock, it had some hard coded password. So once you reverse engineer the mobile application, the hard coded password was there inside the mobile application, and many times uh, a lot of information. Uh, like figuring out how exactly your BLE application is connecting to your fitness track, sorry, a mobile application, every information that you need uh, to connect between a mobile application and your fit, uh, BLE devices is there in the um, uh, mobile applications. So if you're good at reverse engineering, this is a very uh, good chance to start that. Uh, and then after the last one is finally doing some cool stuff, maybe sending some notification, maybe changing uh, the light bulbs, uh, sending, uh, turning on and off your neighbor's light bulb and many other things. Uh, and in the reverse engineering, I would be surprised if it didn't get any information because all the devices that I had tested out had something at least in the mobile applications. So step number zero, that is selecting the target. This is the very first step that you want to do. You want to find out the nearby Bluetooth devices, right? So for that, if you are in Kali or uh, any version of Linux distribution, you have something called uh, BlueZ stack. So uh, BlueZ is, it is as easy as installing sudo apt-gate, install BlueZ. So all the tools that I mentioned earlier, at say tool and GAT tool, comes pre-installed the BlueZ stack. So you can download the BlueZ stack. Once you download the BlueZ stack, uh, you can see the command there, sudo at say tool and lay scan. Lay scan means low energy scan. So you can uh, scan all the low energy devices near your vicinity. Uh, and then, yeah, so if you wanted to do, if you're an Android and you want to do it from your Android mobile phone, you can download this mobile app called NRF Connect. So uh, it allows you to scan the nearby devices using a mobile uh, smartphone. So you can just go to the Google Play Store and download this app. And if you're an iOS, you can download this light blue. Uh, iOS has an RF connect as well as uh, light blue. You can choose either of them. Uh, if a device is actually advertising, if it is not connected to any central server, if it is not in a sleep mode, it should pop up here. So, uh, so this is how exactly it works. At say tool, if you see the at say tool, it's listing out all the nearby uh, devices. There, there is an AMI band. There is a fitness tracker. And the next uh, here, you can see all the BLE devices that I have near my vicinity. And this is a screenshot from the light blue. Uh, you have all the health monitor, all these sort of devices out there. So step number zero is selecting the target. Step number one is enumerating the service and characteristics. Here we're trying to figure out what services does exactly what. Uh, you can do this actively as well as passively. If you want to do it actively, then you can connect the device to your phone. Uh, and you can uh, use apps like I uh, mentioned earlier, light blue and NRF connect to do that. Once you're connected, it's just going to tell what services are running uh, exactly what. So if you go back here, Mm, I didn't have the slide anyways. So uh, once you're connected in your NRF Connect, you, uh, all these characteristics and service are going to have that name. Like the one earlier you saw, device information, right? So like that, you'll have notification service in the fitness trackers, notification service, uh, messaging service, and many other services. Uh, or maybe in the uh, Linux, you can have this tool called SA tool. Using SA tool uh, and Kali machine, or maybe any of your favorite distribution, you can uh, connect using GAT tool. And if you're connected, you can list down all the primary uh, characteristic services using a command called primary and characteristics. This is for HCA tool. So you must have the UUID and handle. If you remember in my earlier uh, third slide, uh, the device information had something called UUID, right? So if you wanted to uh, send or receive any sensor value, if you wanted to send, uh, uh, you know, read what exactly is happening on particular sensor, you need to have a UUID. So that UUID could be, uh, you could get it from uh, HCA tool as well as you could get it from NRF Connect. But if you want to do it passively, that means you want to snip somebody, somebody's connection. Uh, at the beginning of these devices, when they uh, talk with each other, they're like, hey, uh, I'm here and I have this many services and this many characteristics. And my, this service does this and my, this characteristic does that. So what happens is, uh, if you could you know, uh, sniff this communication between the BLE device and the central server using some sort of uh, hardware like uh, Ubertooth, you could know what service is doing exactly what. 
So if you really wanted to snipe the BLE packets, Ubuntu is a perfect solution. Uh, it's like, uh, yeah, Ubuntu is a perfect solution. Uh, it, works uh, both for classic and BLE if you wanted to capture the classic, uh, you, the one which I told if you wanted to do it for your headset, if you want to do it for your speakers, uh, it works for classic as well and it's, uh, it, it runs an open source hardware and software both and it costs somewhere around $100. If you don't want to spend $100, there are cheaper alternatives for that, uh, these really cheap sniffers, uh, CC2540 uh, which is cheaper but with limited configuration. Uh, it doesn't have a higher data uh, rate as much as Ubertooth one, it costs somewhere around $50. Uh, if you're wondering how to capture the packet down to the level, down to the packet level, Ubuntu is the perfect solution. I prefer not to use any sniffers at all because sniffers do drop a lot of packets. So if you're somebody like me who doesn't want to spend any money on hardware, there is an alternative on Android phone. So what I do is every time, uh, there is an app available on Android called uh, NRF Connect which I told you, uh, do install that and let the app communicate with it. So if uh, Example, you, you have a BLE device and you have a uh, its central uh, application, mobile application, uh, the fitness trackers mobile application. So what happens is as soon as you start communicating, they're both going to share a lot of a lot of information, right? So if you really wanted to see that, what you could do is you could go to your settings, developer option and uh, five times, uh, sorry, you can go to the settings and about and tap the build number five times and you could enable this developer option. Once the developer option is enabled, you can enable this Bluetooth at say snoop log. So uh, at say just means host control interface. It's going to log all the communication that is happening between your mobile application and the BLE. So uh, once you get that, you can pull off the file using ADB commands. Uh, I hope you are aware of ADB. If you are not aware of ADB, um, it's Android Debug Breeze. So you can just connect your mobile app. If the, uh, sorry, if the uh, developer option is enabled, you can debug uh, using the ADB. So you can pull the file from SD card and BTS snoop uh, underscore say that log. You could take that file to uh, any packet analyzer, maybe in the Wireshark or anything. I prefer to use Wireshark. So once you have that in the wire side, you can analyze the packets. So here you could see under which uh, you know uh, protocol it is communicating, under which uh, uh, you know uh, UUID it is sending, and what all values it is sending. You could see everything there. So super easy, right? So now what happens is now you're connected. You might ask me the question, "Hey, you guys, I'm connected to the device. Now what's next?" So next step is authentication. The fun thing is. Three of the, uh, yeah, this is one of the metrics that I had. Three of the five devices that I tested didn't had link, uh, link line encryption. And then two of the five devices that I tested didn't even have the authentication. Like the one I was testing out was a smart bulb. So in that smart bulb, the hardware manufacturer thought it would be really fun and really cool to let your neighbor next door to allow your lights to be turned on and off. Since it's a smart bulb, right? They didn't have any authentication. So the, uh, your neighbor next door could actually install the app in his phone and could just turn on and off the light. It was that simple, no any authentication. So, uh, this is the same thing. If they implement these security measures, the cost of the devices are going to go up high. But they have to sell a lot of them. So, they just ignore it. So, uh, after the authentication, uh, yeah, so this was the thing that I was able to do. Now, I was connected to the uh, uh, fitness tracker using my HC tool and GAT tool. I wrote my own scripts. And then after that, I needed to do some really cool stuff, right? So, now you have to reverse engineer uh, the packets. So, once I was reverse engineering the packet, I got something like this. Uh, it was sending value 0, 03, 0, 01, 4, 8, 6, 9 to one particular channel, uh, two particular characteristics. So then I realized it's doing something really cool here. The first one byte, uh, first, uh, first two bytes are actually a notification type. So if you wanted to place a notification saying that, hey, Trump is calling you, maybe you could do, uh, just send 0, 03. Or maybe if you wanted to send somebody, hey, your email is there on the fitness striker, you could just uh, append 0, 01. Uh, you could replace it with a 0, 01. And maybe if it's a missed call, you could just do 0, 04, something like that. And the next one is how many notifications you understand. So if you want to flood the notification, uh, sorry, fitness tracker with a notification, you could just replace that with uh, the number of times you want to send the notification, maybe 99, like that. And the last bytes, last bytes are uh, for sending what you want. So like suppose if I'm sending hi, it's the hex value of si. S is just 48 and i is just 69. So it's uh, calculating hex value and then sending it over the particular uh, characteristics. If you see the characteristics right now, it's 5F9B, 34FB. This is one particular characteristic where the notification is being uh, sent. So how I knew this is because it's from the uh, wires arc. Once you pull that log dot log file, you could take it in the fitness track, uh, sorry, you could take it in the wires arc and analyze this packet. And you would know that when there was actually a notification coming on your phone, on this particular uh, 34FB characteristics, there was some value that was being sent. So once you reverse engineer that, you could figure out it was that simple. So then uh, this is uh, one of the very simple snippet of the code and tool that I built uh, to send the notification. 
if you're interested in looking this tool this tool is there in the uh, github github.com slash yogeshoja spelled as y-o-g-e-s-s-o-j-h-a if you wanted to look into the tools so this is an example what i did so uh, i'm writing the values to one of these services uh, 34 app b so if i do that this is exactly what is going to emulate the, the device so it's going to further notification so uh, what i got after that was i was able to pop up on anybody's uh, fitness tracker saying that trump is calling you or maybe whatever notification that i wanted to pop up it was that simple so let's the next thing that i wanted to do was uh, doing something on the firmware uh, the real question was why was i interested in firmware it's because i saw many people using fitness tracker and i thought why not scare somebody with these uh, icons or maybe images on the fitness trackers so let's first talk about what exactly is firmware firmware is a piece of software that runs on an embedded cpu typically written on c uh, is compiled into binary and that is loaded into your device using a programmer or wired connection but the next question is how do i get the firmware right one option could be reverse engineering the mobile application that i told earlier if they have any and look into the uh, directory called asset inside the asset they're going to have everything for you uh, it could be a firmware it could be a resources and anything otherwise capture the file during the dfa update now this fitness uh, this bl uh, devices they have something called uh, uh, over the year updates right so uh, what happens is over the year if you have something uh, if there is new update it's going to first make a call to some api maybe uh, axdot.y.com slash uh, maybe you know uh, new firmware.fw or something like that so if you capture the firmware during the dfa update you could get the firmware for me i uh, yeah so this is once i reverse engineer the mobile application i think yeah so once i reverse engineer the mobile application in the asset directory this is what i got dot fw file that is a firmware file and dot res file that's a resource file so firmware file uh, you could do a lot of things maybe write on custom firmware for that and for the resource like the, all the images that you have on your fitness tracker everything was there inside the res so uh, if you reverse engineer again both of these you, you can do, uh, use any tools like gidra the recent one uh, launched by nsa Uh, or maybe your favorite hex editors, or maybe whatever you want. You can use either of these tools and then re uh, reverse engineer these firmwares, and again for the resources as well as. So once I got the firmware and the hunt for the firmware uh, update service actually started, because I had to upload. Now I have the firmware. I made send it to the firmware. I had to upload it to somewhere, right? So if you remember, I uh, mentioned an app, powerful app called NRF Connect. This is uh, one of the screenshots from there. So uh, once I got the firmware, I was expecting it to have. clear name device firmware update and then hey upload the firmware here but in reality what happens is hardware manufacturers sometimes slightly to harden the reverse engineering process they might have unknown services so it's not really difficult you could go to github and probably search for this particular uid to see what exactly this uid is doing or maybe just uh, go to google and search what exactly this uid is doing or maybe in the hardware manufacturers uh, specification manual you could just go and uh, look for this particular uid and they have some of the other information on that so uh, once i got this uh, you know once i found out that okay this particular uh, characteristics is actually accept in the firmware i started uploading the firmware and i was uh, wondering i have a file called dot after the file how do i upload the firmware over the year right uh, so uh, yeah so the next thing was how to upload the firmware right so i when i reverse engineered again same thing here reverse engineering the packets in the wire sock is as simple as that so when i reverse engineer i found out that uh it was first sending it was sending 4 byte uh, initially it was sending 4 byte and this particular characteristic 1531 so the first byte it was sending x01 uh, sorry 01 was uh you know uh, initiating the firmware update service it's saying hey now i'm ready to send the firmware to you and this is how i uh, send is using 01 and then uh, it's uh, with that it appends the file size in 3 bytes so if a file size is maybe 100 kb or maybe even 3 4 kb uh it will translate that into your um, the file size into the hex and then it's going to append that with 01 it's going to send it to the uh, uh, sorry uh, characteristic number 1531 once it's sent it's going to uh, the fitness tracker is ready to accept the firmware and it on your fitness tracker it just says hey i'm ready to accept the firmware so now uh, for the resource the difference between the firmware and resource is that firmware actually controls the hardware resource is something which you have uh, maybe your images of that scroll that i showed earlier maybe you have when you receive a phone call you have that phone call image in a fitness tracker right so that's actually resource so for resource is actually 5 bytes uh, it has to tell uh, to the uh, dfu firmware update service saying that hey i'm not sending the firmware i'm sending the resource so it's going to append 02 uh, this particular byte at the end of the uh, this particular packet sending that hey it's not a firmware it's a resource 
So uh, once I started uploading the firmware, and then I realized it was stuck in 99% every time, and it was never accepting the firmware. I spent a lot of time uh, figuring out what exactly was happening. Then I realized there was something important called checksum. So let's see what exactly is checksum. So what is happening there was once the firmware is being sent, it's waiting for checksum values. Uh, so what exactly is checksum? Checksum is a calculated value that is used to determine the integrity of the data during the transmission, uh, so that the man in the middle attack doesn't happen. Checksum stops as a unique identifier uh, for the data that is being transmitted. If the data is changed, the uh, checksum is changed as well, right? Uh, this makes it super easy to verify the integrity of the data over the year. So now, uh, how to verify the integrity is that the sender, when it is sending the firmware, before even sending the firmware, it calculates some particular checksum. Now, receiver, uh, when it finishes accepting, the, uh, finishes receiving the firmware, it is waiting for something called uh, checksum. Now. The sender is going to send the particular checksum to the receiver saying that, hey, this was the checksum that I sent to you. Does this match with you with a high degree of confidence? If the answer is yes, it's going to accept the firmware. If the answer is no, it is not going to accept the firmware. So if the firmware was modified over the year in between, if it was uh, the one I told you earlier, the, uh, like using the Ubuntu, if the um, packet were being modified over the year, it's not going to accept the firmware. Uh, so once, the, once it has high degree of confidence, it's going to accept the firmware. If the checksum matches, the formula is straight accepted. Really doesn't actually really doesn't perform the uh, error correction, but only can perform the error detection. Okay, so uh, Bluetooth 5.0, that is uh, the new version of Bluetooth, it has error correction as well. There are several types of checksum available, but this fitness tracker that I tested had CRC 16. Yeah, so this is how exactly the checksum is being sent. Once uh, you initiate the connections uh, by sending the first 0, 1 bytes and then the file size, the formula is sent. And once you start sending four bytes at a time to the uh, former upload service, the former is 19, up, up to 99 percent. The former is already sent to the uh, you know, uh, uh, fitness tracker. Now what happens is it's waiting for you to send the checksum. Uh, now you would say to the fit, uh, fitness tracker saying that, hey, I'm sending the checksum. That is by initiating with a 0, 4 uh, byte. So now you have a checksum. So now if the checksum is matched with the receiver as well, it is going to straight accept the former. So this is how uh, exactly it's working. At the end, if the firmware is being sent, you could just send 0, 05 to reboot the firmware, to reboot the fitness tracker. And once I uploaded the firmware, this is what I could do. I could change the device name from something, so from some vendor to the Jasper. Jasper is my dog, by the way. So I could change the uh, device name to something else. And then if you see there is something, this is just a proof of concept, right? So I could change the software revision number to version number 9.9.9. Now the uh, funny thing is that this fitness tracker is never going to connect to a um, it's central mobile application is because what happens is it's right now running on the version 9.9.9.9 but the fitness tracker uh, mobile application has the version number example 1.2.3 and it's going to think that there is already a latest software running on the fitness tracker and I don't have to upload and I don't have to connect and I don't have ability to connect so once you change this device name and software vision string you could never connect that uh, particular uh, fitness tracker to the mobile application to the central mobile application and what about this call icon? Yeah, this is what exactly I was able to do by uh, uploading the form, by changing the firmware and then reverse engineering the uh, resources file. Again, this is just a proof of concept, but you could do a lot of things. You could exploit much more than this. Firmware upload uh, update over the year is actually a really cool feature that is found nearly on all the embedded devices. I demonstrated this feature, how this feature could be exploited to allow attackers to inject malicious firmware uh, modification to embedded devices. The problem here is that hardware manufacturers do not do not cryptographically sign the firmware for these small devices. So what happens is, uh, at any point in time, this uh, uh, fitness tracker will accept firmware from anybody. That doesn't matter if that is from the uh, particular vendor or maybe uh, any attacker that has actually injected particular firmware. So you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to physically toss that fitness tracker to upload that. You could just sit here and send the firmware to uh, anybody's fitness tracker. It's just going to accept that. If they uh, the solution for this could be cryptographically signing the firmware. Again, the same same answer. If they uh, do all this sort of security stuff, the cost of the devices is the main issue, right? Yeah. So I'm at the end of my talk. So does anybody has any questions for me? If this tool is available there in the GitHub, maybe you could just download that. This tool is readily available. If you wanted to prank your friends or maybe anybody, and if you wanted to hack any fitness tracker in your vicinity, this tool is there in the GitHub as well. Uh, yeah, this particular the one I did was for MF band. You could change some other. In, uh, you could change the characteristics actually. It's just that characteristics is different, right? So you could change the characteristic and you could uh, do the same thing on any other fitness tracker as well.
Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, did you get in touch with the manufacturers of this device to inform them about the possibility? Uh, yeah, I, I got in touch with the device manufacturer. Uh, I got in touch with them, but the problem is that uh, they just don't want to implement that because of the device cost issues, right? This is the problem with the BLE stack where you could sniff the packets, right? Uh, yes, I was in touch with the manufacturers. So thank you. Thank you for joining me here. Thank you.